Hey there, my name is Scott McKnight. My wife and I, we have a uh, group that we help individuals navigate insurance and recovery after a house fire. So we have a free Facebook group that you are welcome to join. We have information about that in the link below or in the description below. And as a reminder, these videos are not legal or professional advice. If you're looking for legal and professional advice, we strongly encourage you to seek that out elsewhere. Um, this, the information we have here in the uh, in these videos, in our Facebook group, in our book, and also in our course, simply just share with you about the experiences that we have experienced after our house fire and the experiences of others. Uh, again, please consider joining the free Facebook group. Again, link in the comments below or in the description below. And then if you have found that this video is successful and helpful for you, we'd like you to give us a thumbs up, give us a like, and then also hit the subscribe button. So as we begin to uh, continue to unfold what this looks like from the in fire, from the insurance and the fire recovery process, we're going to start getting into the actual claim process and what that looks like. So if you have not done so already, please take a look at some of the other videos that we have, some of the other videos that Lydia has put together. And we'd like to just kind of begin to uncover what this process uh, is going to look like. Again, every individual's experience is different. No two situations are the same. And ultimately, the goal at the very end is to restore your home to its pre-loss condition. That is the goal. Your home is, a, is your asset, okay? You have paid insurance for a reason. You have paid insurance so that in the event that you have an event, a loss, that you have money already there and available for using that or an event such as a house fire. So within the first few days after your loss, you will have a contact with your field adjuster or several adjusters to discuss your property and your contents. We're gonna to continue to share with you kind of two things. One will be your property. The other is going to be your contents. So your property is the actual structure of your home. The contents is everything inside. So clothing, furniture, uh, cabinets that are not attached to a wall, mirrors, pictures, all of that. Those are your contents. It is possible the same adjuster will handle your contents, or you might get a second adjuster. Every group, every fire, every insurance claim is going to be different on that. Okay? As far as the process, it's going to be challenging. We're not going to tell you that it's not. It is challenging. Why? Because your home is honestly your largest asset. The process should not be taken lightly. It should be taken very carefully, diligently. Um, and you really need to be treating the entire process, the entire event, as a business transaction. Okay? It may not feel right. It may not seem right that that's what it is. But at this point, your home is nothing more than a business transaction. So you got to really keep that in mind. So at this point, you've made it through the immediate aftermath. Uh, of your loss, the battle, unfortunately, has just begun, okay? You're going to continue to work with your insurance agent, your insurance adjusters. Everybody might seem nice in the very beginning. Things might be a little bit different in the long run, though, okay? Remember, these individuals do not work for you. We have to say that again. These individuals do not work for you. We truly believe that there are many insurance professionals, many restoration professionals who are really great at their job, really do view that you as their customer, as their client, um, they, they really do want to do well for you. But we also understand that it may not be the reality. So the fight starts right now. Please know that the fight starts now. When you first meet with your adjuster, they will likely come prepared with a copy of your policy. We've expressed it before, we'll continue to share. You need to read your policy. You need to become familiar with your policy. You need to reread your policy again. You need to become very intimately familiar with your policy because you're gonna be asking questions. Your insurance adjuster is going to be sharing information with you that's already in your policy. And to be honest, we never looked at our policy. We never did until we had the house fire. We were sitting on the front lawn looking at our policy. That's the last time you wanna be doing it. And unfortunately, that's probably more of the reality than anything. Your insurance adjuster knows specific parts about your policy. They know verbiage that's in there. Uh, they know maybe specific limits or policy settings. At the end of the day, your policy will dictate everything. Okay? No matter what your insurance policy states, 
Again, the goal for any loss is to have your home restored to its pre-loss condition. Okay? It needs to be restored to the way that you knew it before your loss. The age of the original building material doesn't matter. Quality, however, does. So, for instance, you may have had a premium light fixtures, like those ugly, nasty chandeliers that you've probably hated looking at for the entire time you've lived in your home. Doesn't matter how long they've been there. Doesn't matter if they were original, if they were put in by a previous owner. Doesn't matter if you put them in. But if they were premium, you need to have them restored or replaced with something that is the same as, like, or better than the original. Okay? Your home is going to be restored to its pre-loss condition. And you are going to get what is there that is the same as, like, or better than the pre-loss condition. Doesn't matter how old they were. All right, or how ugly you thought they were. So then you're going to be meeting with your insurance adjuster. Eventually, you're going to find the right repair professional and your restoration uh, process will become the focus of really a joint effort between you, your adjuster, your agent, whomever. You're going to be working with your adjuster and others who are assigned to your case. Company adjusters, you might hear them called inside desk adjusters, um, but they also include your field adjuster. That's the person you're going to meet with the day of actually at your home. Um, you might also have independent adjusters which work for the insurance company and not for you. Um, they also have the experience, the obligation to make your claim process fair and efficient. So they are legally obligated to make sure that your claim process is fair and efficient, not good or bad, but fair and efficient. So remember that. Uh, they do work for the insurance company. They are not working for you. This is a business transaction. So please keep that in mind. Okay. Now, you might be thinking, why does this guy keep saying business transaction? Like, Scott, this is not a business transaction. This is my home. I understand that your home is important. Your home is emotional, that you care a lot about your home. Totally get that. We cared about our home, too. The problem is... Your home is nothing more than a business transaction. It feels different because it's where you lived. It's where maybe you want to go back to. It's maybe where you want to move away from, but it feels different. I get that. It was your house. It was your home. It's probably where you raised your kids. It might even be where you grew up. It's been in your family for decades and centuries. Please keep in mind that this is a business transaction at the end of the day, and it has to be viewed and it has to be kept as such because your adjuster is going to view it as a business transaction. You've got to be thinking about it as the same as they are. We'll discuss more as we move on why that's so important. You're also going to hear about another adjuster called the public adjuster. This is someone that you could hire. It doesn't mean you have to hire them. This is somebody you could hire, someone who you are working directly with in exchange for a predetermined fee. It's often 10 to 20% of the overall claim amount. Sometimes it's 25%. Every, every claim, every situation is different. Some people feel that the public adjuster is the preferred way. We didn't choose that. I'm not saying it's a good way or a bad way. It's just you have to make the determination. And we'll cover that later on in these videos. We cover it in our book. We'll cover it in our course, talking through what does that look like and why should you hire a public adjuster. Again, you're not obligated to use them, um, but they can fight for you kind of alongside of uh, kind of alongside the situation. The challenge with public adjusters, and I'll throw this out now, is that if you hire a public adjuster, a lot of times your insurance company will not work for you. They're like, you know what, I'm done. We're not communicating with you. Uh, we communicate with the public adjuster, or the public adjuster will just kind of take over. Every adjuster is different. Every situation is different. So it's a topic for later on. So when you first meet with your adjuster, you're likely not going to be thinking clearly. We've talked initially about some of the traumatic events, how that actually works with you, how that happens to you. Something I did not cover in that video, but something that's really important is just to keep in mind that as a, uh, as a traumatic event, a lot of times when you're going through a significant traumatic event in the moment, you cannot think of anything more than three things at one time, okay? So three things at one time is all you can focus on. That's all you can think about. It doesn't mean that something's bad or good. It's just that's all you can think about. Um, 
So keep that in mind as you're thinking through some of this. The reason why that's important is because you're going to have a lot of information thrown at you and you're not really going to be able to focus well. Um, and sometimes the adjusters get frustrated with that and they want to know, well, why aren't you thinking clearly? Why are you thinking, you know, irrationally here, according to them? The reason is you're not thinking clearly. You just had a traumatic event and this is as much as you can focus on at one time. Keep that in mind. The adjuster, no matter what, should always oblige with your request, okay? So the one thing we're going to just harp on over and over and over is that your adjuster may come to your initial encounter well-prepared, rested, taken care of. Um, you may not. They might be ready to come and give you information. You're not ready to receive the information. Everything that they tell you needs to be given to you in writing by email, okay? You ask for everything that is discussed to be sent to you by email. The reason for that is, again, you're not thinking clearly. You want to be able to have time later on to reflect on it, to think about it, to read it and reread it, to write notes, to take notes. Um, you want time to be able to do that. And everything from this point moving forward needs to be given to you in writing. Okay? Again, we will continue to remind you of that because this is very important. Everything needs to be to you in writing. And again, the adjuster should oblige with that. If they give you any pushback, it may warrant escalation. And we cover that later on, how to actually do that in a section that we have titled Having Your Voice Heard. Because it really is important. It's well known that individuals who have experienced traumatic events are unable to process multiple details. And that's the reason why you want to do this. So your insurance company uh, adjuster is going to inspect your damages. They're going to investigate your claim. Their focus is very narrow. Okay? Focus is very narrow. These four areas are often going to include documenting covered damages and estimating repair costs, determining cause and origin of the fire, assessing the claim for fraud, but ultimately their job, minimizing the total claim uh, settlement necessary to save the most money for the insurance company. They do not work for you. Remember that. They do not work for you. They're there working for the insurance company, the company that you have been paying for years, possibly decades, having never used them, having never uh, taken out a loan or a claim or anything else. Um, but now all of a sudden you need to use their services. Yeah. So the adjuster is going to go in. They're going to record things. They're going to photograph. They're going to come prepared. They're likely going to spend three to four hours at your property inspecting, looking, taking photos, doing all of that. They're also likely going to come to meet you at your home so that they don't have to drive because if they have to drive, then that's extra fuel they have to take out of their own pocket. I honestly wish we would have met elsewhere. I really do. I wish that we would have met elsewhere. And the reason is you're literally still smelling the smoke, and it's possible that there's still some heat even in the house. It's weird, but you might even feel that. And it's traumatic. Like, this is not real. Like, this isn't where people go to hang out and sit on your front lawn or in your unconditioned house. Like, is that real? What is for them? And again, it's often going to be three to four hours in length. So this is going to be a long time. It's a lot, right? So your adjuster is likely going to arrive or they may arrive or later on recommend a general contractor. No matter what, we recommend not working with them. Okay. We recommend that you do not use their contractor or sign any of their documents indicating that they are approved to work on your house. They will try to convince you of that. They may give you some like weird thing that says, hey, if you sign today or within the next 24 to 48 hours, uh, then we can do this for a specific set price. Remember, big thing here. Everything needs to be given to you in writing. Everything. You need to thoroughly read and understand anything before you sign it. You also need to know that you can trust your contractor. You need to have vetted reviews, not Reviews that they are providing, but reviews that you have gone out and sought after. And also remember this, the first estimate, the estimate that they're obtaining right then, right there, does not exist. It is not real. 
that estimate is not the final estimate. That is an estimate. It is the first estimate of that. It is completely inaccurate. Um, I'll leave it at that. You need to completely review your quote. You need to completely review the claim. You need to completely review the estimate. And do not trust the first estimate. It is well known that insurance companies will provide you with the initial estimate and they're only giving you 60 to 70% of what the claim is actually needing to be, okay? It sounds like a high number. It sounds like an accurate number because, well, they're professionals after all. You would trust them. The problem with that is it's not accurate because it's just the first estimate. It is impossible for them to have seen everything in your home and to document everything in your home. That's a several day event to document everything in your home. I don't care who experienced, how experienced you are or who you are. It takes several days to do that. And to photograph everything and to then document it and log it, that is a week to two or three week process. That is not something that's gonna happen the day that they show up, okay? So how do they obtain that estimate? Where do they get that information from? So there's a program called Xactimate um, or Xactware. You'll hear some different words that are thrown around. So Xactware is kind of the software company. You've got Xactimate and you've got Exact like contents, I think is what it's called, the other one. So the software, we'll, we'll discuss that later on. We'll kind of highlight you know that later on. It is an industry standard. I think there are like two, maybe three main softwares that are used in Xactimate. It's the most well-known, uh, the most widely used. Inside of the platform, all it takes is just one click to then open up a lot more options, uh, but also to kind of give a lot of error. It takes just one simple click to make a lot of errors. So be aware of that. The platform gives out a printout. Um, so the platform is, it's, it's a detailed estimate. It's based upon criteria that they have personally entered. You'll never see access to this uh, unless you want to pay several thousand dollars a year to get access to it. Um, the, the software is fantastic. It, it's amazing. It is updated every month and it's based on your location. It's based on your locale. So you're not going to be seeing um, rates for like Southern California if you live in Iowa. Okay or the Dakotas. You're also not going to see rates for New York if you live in Florida. It's going to be based uh, geographically for your location. Again, it gives them a printout. It may not give them an, an approximate amount of hours of labor, uh, including clean out, demo, construction, furnishings, but it will provide them with many important details to assist in kind of building that and rebuilding your home. Details of your loss and the cost to rebuild, replace, restore, will change dramatically based on just a few simple clicks. So know that. Again, you will not accept the first estimate. Uh, and you're not required to sign anything immediately. So keep that in mind. You can request for another estimate to be completed by even another field adjuster. The first field adjuster is not, that you do not have to work with them uh, through the end of your claim. If you feel like something's off, you are allowed to request another estimate by another field adjuster. Chances are the cost, the insurance company is not gonna fight that because it's gonna be kind of expensive for them to send somebody else out. So they might just give you a little bit of flexibility on some of the asks that you have. We'll talk more about that later on. Um, you should have several general contractors. We suggest at least three restoration contractors, okay? Contractors who have experience in restoration work. They are the ones who are gonna review your estimate for any gaps that they can detect and then um, in the proposed restoration process. You need to know who your contractor is. You need to feel comfortable who your contractor is. If there's any question, don't use them, okay? You're not required to use any certain contractor. So how do you locate a contractor? And again, we'll talk about this later on, but just high level for right now, it's imperative that you find somebody that you trust, somebody, whether you know them or not, but somebody that you like and somebody that you trust. And it needs to be based on a few things. It needs to be based on like some public reviews. It needs to be based on 
maybe some other people um, sharing, other professionals sharing about them. So whether you choose to rebuild your home, we did not choose to rebuild our home, but whether you choose to rebuild your home or you choose to move to another property is not all that important at this time. Okay. Many contractors, just to share this, many contractors will not touch a loss that has been impacted by fire because they know that there's a lot of work, there's a lot of headache that they have to face. So in keeping with some of that, here are some ideas for where you can go or how you can search for a contractor. And here's a few like red flags, if you will. So finding a contractor is going to seem like a big daunting task, but here are some things to keep in mind. So first, do not work with somebody uh, who is maybe your best friend or someone looking for their first job. Like, oh yeah, my buddy, he's a great contractor. He might be an awesome contractor. Has he ever dealt with fires before? If the answer is no, you don't want your home being the first big fire, the first big claim that they've ever had. They could be a great contractor. They could be a great resource. But you can get in over your head very quickly when dealing with fires. And then also, you need to be able to trust your contractor. and They need to be able to trust you. But you also need to be able to push back if you have any kind of questions, comments, or concerns. And if you're working with your best friend, can they accept that? Can they trust that? If they can, great, but don't always just looking for somebody who's just starting out looking for their first big job. It's a big problem. You need somebody who has experience in local building codes. So, and also reviewing quotes and really even somebody who has experience with Xactimate. Okay. If you ask them, have you ever dealt with Xactimate before? And they say, I'm not sure what that is. You should probably look for somebody else who has experience in dealing with Xactimate. Don't use the person with the most billboards or other ads in your community. Uh, we have personal experience with that. Um, don't use the person with the most billboards. They just like to spend lots of money, and they may not necessarily have the, the best quality of work. Keep that in mind. Doesn't necessarily mean that's the case, but that might be something to consider. Don't use a contractor who's the most eager for work. And they say, we can get started tomorrow. Uh, why are you not busy right now? Most good contractors are going to be booked out like five, six months before any of their crews are available. Okay. Ask the American Red Cross or maybe another disaster relief agency in your area for suggestions. If you've got a reputable disaster relief foundation, um, somebody in your area that has done disaster work, they might have a good contractor in mind. The Red Cross probably can't suggest to you somebody personally, but they might be able to point you in a direction. Contact a local insurance agent, preferably independent agents. They are going to be really solid with um, knowing who some good contractors are, folks they've worked with before. The independent ones are probably going to be better than uh, a chain insurance agent that you have not worked with before because they're not necessarily tied to any one company. They've got lots of options. So keep that in mind. A lot of times your secretaries are really good resources. Definitely ask friends, family, and peers who have experience uh, in contracting or with restoration work. Again, restoration work is going to be different from typical just flood, wind, and hail damages. So it's going to be something you're going to want to keep in mind. Uh, real estate agents, another good local option. Checking out with your independent real estate agents. They've got any contractors in mind that they would recommend. Looking just for, you know, on Google, looking at restoration contractors near me, that's going to be a, another option. And then maybe another option would be looking at like local hardware stores. Okay. So looking at your local mom and pop hardware stores, even at your big box stores, looking at the um, business cards that are there. I mean, it's an option. May not be the best option, but it is still an option nonetheless. Okay. So again, choosing a contractor is going to be overwhelming. We recommend gathering at least at least three, because you want multiple eyes on your quote. You don't just want to trust the first person. Uh, your home is your largest asset. You don't want to trust the process just to anybody uh, in dealing with such a complex loss. Like you really want people right there with you and guiding you and directing you. Um, people who have maybe been in the business a long time. Okay. Another area of concern is going to be mitigating further loss. So it's your responsibility as a homeowner. This is going to be the last section for this video. 
you have a responsibility to make sure that you're that you don't have any further damages that occur to your home. One of those options is through like a board up company. They're going to be able to come in usually the day of or the next day and really provide some security to your home. So that might be through like plywood sheeting, might be through tarps on the roof, might be just simply by locking, changing out locks or something, um, boarding up, you know, different areas. So that is certainly going to be one option. Uh, you are responsible to make sure that further damage does not occur despite this, you know, seeming like it is your responsibility, right? So we've mentioned it in a few other videos, but know that, so even though fire has already happened, that's just one part of the puzzle. You also have water, smoke, and soot that also continue to impact your home. So water, standing water obviously does some nasty things, okay? To floors, walls, ceilings, electronics, big time electronics. Um, insulation has also been impacted due to water. It's gonna act as a sponge creating even more damage, okay? It's gonna soak it up in through the wall. Smoke, this has a strong tendency to move into crevices. Crevices you did not even know that existed in your home. Smoke and its lingering odors will remain trapped and even just the smallest of cracks. Um, we recently had a, a family member or a friend, family friend that had a house fire and they had, I'll just point right up here. If you look at the kind of the joint right here between the ceiling and the wall, um, where those two meet or really just wherever you would have drywall tape, that makes sense. You want to take a look at those areas because they may appear okay. They may appear like, oh, it's totally fine, like in other rooms. However, with our friend, I ended up walking around their house and you can see black soot right up here, just beyond the drywall tape. Interesting. So right above that room was an attic and the fire, uh, the fire adjuster, the, the insurance adjuster said, Nope, it never went in the attic. Well, that's interesting because the insurance adjuster also never went into the attic. How can you say it never encroached in the attic when they never physically went or observed the attic space? Yeah, kind of interesting, right? So it was the next day or two days later after their fire, I was walking around without anybody else there except for the homeowner and I saw the black. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. So it didn't go into the attic, according to the fire uh, insurance adjuster. But it's interesting how there's smoke and soot stains on the ceiling through the drywall tape. Pretty interesting. What does that show? It shows that it was in the attic space and it encroached and it crept out. So you look for smoke stains, you look for soot. Soot will be on everything. You're going to get dirty. You're going to get black. Um, soot damages everything that touches. Okay. And later on in, the, in this series, we're going to talk about some of the damages and the destruction uh, of the hidden and ongoing damages you will see. So restoration companies will often inform you that they can nearly restore everything, get it back to its pre-loss condition. However, nothing, absolutely nothing will be restored to its pre-loss condition after a fire. Okay. Fire, water, smoke, and soot destroy everything, no matter how well or how impermeable they may initially appear. Many items can be cleaned. The question is, should they be cleaned? Okay. So try to reserve item restoration for those items that are most sentimental and not for the everyday common items, such as clothing. Um, everything else should be replaced. We wholeheartedly believe that because the odor is going to linger. They will tell you that they use all these high-tech, fancy gas exchange processes. The majority of the time, they use Dawn dish soap and water. Pretty high-tech. Um, that's not a plug to use Dawn, but when we ended up sending a few of our items away for restoration, we chose just a few things, and that's exactly what our restoration company told us. They're like, oh, yeah, no, we, we actually use Dawn dish soap and water. That's all we use. Uh, unless we really needed to like go deeper on something like kind of like sanding it down, but typically no. Like wood items? Nah, we just use Dawn dish soap and water. I'm like, I just paid you how much money <laughs> and I could have used Dawn dish soap and water? Are you kidding me? Okay. So 
Uh, continuing on with this, your insurance policy likely has a neglect exclusion, meaning you are legally required to ensure that uh, you provide a timely, you know, timely resolve of your property. It is a no exclusions, no excuses exclusionary clause. It's your policy pays the expense to complete temporary emergency repairs, such as a board up, lock up, sewage removal, et cetera. Okay. Your insurance company is legally allowed to deny you coverages for anything that you fail to prevent or you fail to mitigate, you fail to resolve. So before you begin any emergency repairs, make certain your building is safe to enter, check with utility companies, make sure everything's been turned off, make sure you have approval from your insurance company to do these things. And if the interior of the home is water soaked, you must be cautious with fans, heaters, and other electrical devices due to a shock type hazard. Okay, your safety is paramount. Um, your insurance company will encourage you to begin the restoration process as soon as is reasonably possible so that they can help with mitigating any additional losses. A lot of times, water will lead to what? Mold or moss. Your, your insurance likely does not cover mold or moss. Okay, so you have to do this stuff fairly quickly. Again, you're not obligated to use any one company, any mitigation, any mitigation specialist. But you do need to go through and review anything that you uh, have in front of you before signing. Okay. So some additional recommendations. Immediately hire a reputable restoration contractor to complete temporary emergency repairs to prevent any additional damages. Be sure the contract is limited to emergency work only for this, for this event, for this period. You need to dry out floors, walls, and water soaked property. And then you're going to separate damaged items from undamaged items to prevent further damage. Okay. A lot of times people hire companies to do this. Are you allowed to do it yourself? You absolutely are. So mitigation can be very expensive. It's also can be very unsafe. Uh, there's a lot of risks, a lot of hazards involved. So you need to limit it to work that is absolutely needed until you get agreements from your insurance company for what they will pay. Please know that. Failure to obtain anything in writing and really everything in writing will cost you tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars in the lost replacement value. It's always best to save the headache by getting it in writing, even if it takes a few extra days. Okay. So get everything in writing, make sure that you do that. That is your responsibility as your homeowner. Okay. So you're going to make sure that you have that done. You need to read everything. Do not trust anybody blindly. Read everything in writing get it in writing, and then that's pretty much the extent for making sure that you've mitigated what you need to mitigate at this time, okay? Again, if you have found this video to be helpful, please like it, subscribe, let us know how we can help further. You're gonna continue to see videos dripped out, uh, at least 20 videos, if not more than that. And if you would like to jump into our pre facebook group, information in the description below about that, about our book, and about our course. All right, we'll catch you on the next one. Take care.